Excellent. Okay. We are live and it is six o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and begin our second chat that we're doing for our Canine Conservancy group. And our team is all back together. Hope you guys have had a good month um, since last time we've seen everybody. And uh, we're going to go talk, um, we're going to do a three part series about um, Breeding 101. Before we get into that, uh, we do have um, some homework and challenges for you, and I'll give you your homework first, and that is we're asking you to invite people to this group if, you know, they're interested, part of dogs. Um, there's all different topics that we'll talk about when we get together and gather like this, so you take what you need for your toolbox and, um, you know, do what you want with the rest. <laughs> but we enjoy speaking um, and talking and conversing with each other. And then we will come, um, you know, with our challenge before we log off for the evening. So glad everybody's joining us um, tonight. And like I said, we are gonna talk, um, do the first part of our uh, Breeding 101 series this evening. And what we're gonna talk about first uh, is kind of how we got started in all of this with our breeding and everything. And so, um, Let's share our stories, and I think what we'll do is we'll, I'll just, the way y'all are on my screen, I'll just kind of round robin that way. I think it'll be easier. So, Doug, let's start with you tonight. Let's, um, can you share with us how you got started in breeding? Sure, I'll be brief. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about um, being in dogs is that we all come at a different point in our life, and I was very young, 14, 15 years old, working at a vet clinic, and I discovered purebred dogs there. And there was a clumber spaniel that came in and I just became so interested. I think young people were like a sponge and we just sort of, um, I sort of just soaked up everything when there was about this unique animal. It was a world unknown to me. And so I was fortunate to develop a lifelong friendship and mentorship with the breeder of that dog. And she took a leap of faith and trusted me and I think she found in me what I think we all look for is someone who was, you know, actively looking for something. And I think that's true of a lot of young people. I think that's why we're so interested in young people in the sport, you know, get them young and we can mold them into, you know, dog show people. So that's sort of how I got started. Um, went to college with the dog uh, and rest is history. Uh, it was a great, great introduction. Excellent, thank you so much. Let's go over to um, Antoinelle. You wanna talk about how you got started? Yeah, so I mean, my journey has been a little different and you know, I've only been in the dog world for I wanna say like seven years. Um, yeah, so I grew up with golden retrievers just as pets. And uh, it wasn't until I started working at the AKC that I realized like, wow, there's so much more out there, so many more options. and um, different things that I could participate in. So, I mean, one time I went to a dog show and I saw um, Larry Cornelius and Charlie, it was a Sky Terrier. He was campaigning in the ring at the time. And I just thought like, that was the coolest and strangest dog I've ever seen. And I kind of wanted to learn more about it. So, you know, I did my research and um, I brought it up to one of my coworkers at the time. And she's like, if you're serious about this, you know, you should reach out to the parent club. So I did just that. I wrote a very lengthy email introducing myself and uh, the president got back to me pretty quickly, which is nice. And um, she put me in touch with breeders located in uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So they were the closest to me geographically. And so I introduced myself to them and um, we just started an email exchange conversation, you know, for the, over the next few months. And then I finally met them at a dog show and uh, got to see these dogs and spend quality time with them and like got to hold them and stuff. And um, yeah, so fast forward to, I think it was a year and a half later, they had puppies and I was able to get one of them. So I kind of did the traditional route, you know, parent club, breeder, introducing myself and they have been amazing mentors to me. Um, great friends and are just like my biggest cheerleaders. So I've had a very, very fortunate experience getting involved in dogs. Excellent. Bill, let's go over to you. 
Well, you know, I thought this was rather interesting because when we first um, discussed uh, having a, a 101 meeting about the uh, connecting with someone to acquire a dog from, I had been so far from that that I didn't really uh, think a great deal about it until you, you all brought up the subject. And, and it's an incredibly important part of becoming or um, being involved in the sport. And so in that, I, I did um, reflect on my um, path and journey to uh, uh, becoming um, and doing what I, what I do. But may I just say that um, it's, it's, it's imperative that we all um, open um, ourselves up to the thought of sharing um, our lives. And it is because this is as much about or more about us as humans than it is about the dogs, because we're the caretakers, we're the directive, we're the ones um, who are making it happen. The dogs don't. Um, so in that, my, my journey, I was very young. I got my first dog um, from a local breeder. And isn't that how a lot of us begin? Um, when I was in the third grade, and my parents were very young. Uh, cooperative, you, you must uh, think. And, and as I progressed, I became more and more interested. And I was always interested in breeding. And of course, I was a professional handler for a couple of decades. And I did that because that's how I could facilitate my involvement in um, being a breeder. My first um, actual uh, involvement was with a woman by the name of Mary Rogers and uh, of Marienburg Kennels, one of the probably the most famous breeder of Doberman Pinschers in the United States ever. Um, I may be stretching it, but I don't think so. You know, I mean, there are some that are better known like Peggy Adamson, but uh, Mary Rogers um, owned many of the cornerstone stud dogs, uh, imported, exported many dogs. And may I say she had no um, qualms about sharing her experience and her dogs with other uh, fledgling breeders. And uh, she uh, took me under her wing, you might say. She and I became fast friends. As a matter of fact, um, in, in this journey of mine, I actually lived with them. Um, going, I went to high school. I don't know how my parents ever allowed it, but they, I, I lived there for two years and um, learned and soaked up so much. And, and there's so much information that I learned uh, that I share with people today in that first part of my journey that it, it, it's interesting about getting back to basics and, and sharing those that basic information. And I could talk about this for hours, so I'll quit for now and hopefully contribute more later. So, Great. Thank you so much. All right, Jenny, let's hear your story. All right. It's my turn. Well, um, I wanted to get a dog since I was an undergrad, and all the grad students had a dog. So you know what I had to do when I started grad school? I had to get a dog. So I graduated, um, and over the summer before I started grad school, I started researching all sorts of breeds. I did the breed selectors, watched all the breed all about it, and I found the greater Swiss mountain dog. I've always liked something a little bit different. And of course, all the breeders like, don't sell her one. She's never owned a dog a day in her life. Um, and she's single. She's going to grad school. She's going to be too busy. Um, one breeder, local, you know, pretty local breeder, took pity on me, gave me a dog, and I put 26 titles on him. And after that, they said, okay, well, maybe she's legit. We'll give her more. Um, <laughs> so that was the start of my first breed. And the way that I rolled into my second breed is actually, um, I started breeding or started my breeding attempts with that, um, the Lauchen was I went to an obedience seminar. So anybody who knows Greater Swiss, we do obedience for comic relief. And uh, I went to this obedience seminar and I saw this dog with his haircut and I thought, well, not really for me. I want a Papillon, but this dog had 65 titles by the time it was four years old. So I'm sitting with the dog where 170 is pretty good. I'm like, I like that. I want that dog that I can get a 200 with in obedience. And uh, the next week she called me and said, my breeder has two litters and you can have your pick. And that's how I started my journey, getting into dogs and getting into breeding. Excellent. Um, I'll share my story to wrap up the conversation. I was a second year teacher at 24 years old and I had two little dogs and one was a dachshund and then I had a dachshund mix because our neighbor had one and she was the fiercest, most terrible little dachshund you've ever knew. So I just had to have one and it didn't have hair. So I was like, that's perfect. And uh, I came across a lady in town out in the middle of West Texas that happened to breed um, standard smooth and standard long hair dachshunds. And I went to her house and bought my first little dog for 
$300 and put a championship on him. And it just blew up from there and just went crazy. And within a year I had uh, met my mentor and she let me borrow her dog to go to Westminster because I wanted to go and we ended up winning. And then I was definitely hooked. So here we are 20 years later <laughs> and, um, you know, it's definitely a journey. So uh, thank you everybody for sharing your stories. I just love the origin stories. And I think our, um, anyone out there listening or, you know, no matter what their experience level is, either remembers how they got started or just kind of getting started and they can relate. So um, let's talk about our next topic, which is really near and dear to my heart. I think it's very, very important um, in, in dogs, no matter how long you've been in it. And that is mentorship. Um, this is going to be uh, part of our breeding talk this evening. So let's talk about mentorships and, um, you know, how, how people get started in this. Uh, you know, not everyone's lucky enough to just trip into the parent club or anything. So let's talk about what do you guys think? Let's get some feedback on mentorship and, you know, how do you get started in trying to find a mentor and what we're doing? One of the things that I think is so interesting that listening to all these stories is there are so many unique paths to the same point. You know, how do you get started? We all get started differently. We all get started at a different phase in your life. You know, it, it is a little unusual for someone like Bill and myself. I mean, we started in you know grade school. It's the most people come to dogs much later. So it's, a, it's an interesting journey and finding, you luck into, we hear th these stories of, I lucked into, I mean, Antoinette lucks into this. I lucked into my mentor. She have, you know, when you have these odd breeds that are scarce and you find them you know, within an hour from your house, it's pretty unusual. So it's what you're drawn to. So you get lucky and you find someone who is an open book, who is interested in um, sort of the precursor to the preservation that we've known. We're always looking for more and more people to get involved in what we're doing that share a passion and can start to cultivate a vision that's similar to where we're going and share the journey. So we, we look for those people, both in mentors and as a mentor. Uh, so I think that's, that's one of the common threads. Mentoring is vitally important. It's, it's what lays the foundation for your career and the path you take in dogs. Right. And, you know, I think it's important to remember that this is all um, a prid pro quo, that it's an association, that it's a back and forth, that um, it doesn't ebb and flow just uh, one direction, it hits back and forth. And to say that um, when you're looking for someone, I think you should research what you want, what you as a new fledgling dog enthusiast, breeder, what you desire to be and do. And then it's the importance of the mentor to understand what your desire and motivation is and where you'll go. Because so many people will come to you and say they want to be this and you have to step back and explain well, this is what it involves. And they go, well, maybe I like that part, but not this part. So you have to get to know each other and have a relationship where you can garner trust and stability in that. And you're going to be a very select few with a very few breeders. Breeders don't have time if they're breeding um, to have uh, 20 um, mentees. I mean, to some degree they will, but you know, I, I have three that I've taken on and one just recently because of this whole idea. And in that, you know, if you're going to really teach them something and really pass something on to them, you really have to be involved and in, in, in work directly with them. So if you're wanting to be someone's mentee and be work with them, you need to really be sure that's the person you want to work with. And, and you know, that comes with a great deal of research from um, looking and seeing what your mind's eye is of your breed and where the direction of that particular breeder or mentor is going and know a great deal about them. So when you go to them, you can feed them information about stuff that they are already doing in their own bloodlines and in their own pedigrees that they can that you can share with them that will interest them and stimulate them. That's how 
I really got interested in the people that I'm working with is I just suddenly went, wow, you know, that's really terrific. They know as much about um, my pedigree or, as, or who I just bred to or who I haven't bred to as, as, as I do. So all of that's relevant. And, and, but, but just to say, uh, stepping back is, is that you need to find someone that you can work with and that you like, and, and there's so many things involved. And so you really need to research your mentor, uh, just not go to someone because their um, the, uh, their dogs are hugely successful or they're hugely successful in one aspect or the other. And since this is all about breeding, I think you should really take into consideration the um, objectives of those people centrally and what they do in their breeding ideas and relationships and how you can fit into that. As I said, it's a give and take situation. And so that uh, mentee should be giving as much as the mentor is giving. And whenever you set out to teach anyone anything, you learn more than, than you're even teaching. So, um, I'll, I, so, so you can hear other ideas, I'll be quiet. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. Uh, Antoinette, what do you think about mentoring and well, I'm obviously very passionate about this topic because I've been, um, I've, they've directly impacted my life and my entire influence in dogs. Um, but I think it all starts with, you know, getting in touch with and reaching out to these breeders that, I mean, if you admire their dogs, if you've seen them in the ring or something, you know, when you first make contact with them, you know, I definitely think it's important to introduce yourself, just write a little bit about yourself and, you know, just kind of like, just get a feeling for things. And um, I just want people to understand that, um, sorry, I'm just like thinking about this. Um, but, you know, I just feel like people don't really know nowadays how to write an email or just kind of talk about the, I don't know why I'm like. It's like the approach, like, you know, you're yeah. one, you know, how yeah. do you approach someone to, you know, like Bill said, you know, you, you, we, we want someone to come to us with a bunch of research and well, you know, we're in the society today is so fast and so quick, you know, with a text or a message that it's like, Hey, you know, how are you? You want this instant gratification and there's a lot of um, prep work to do to become that mentee. One of yes. the things that I think is sort of interesting and I hope I'll talk on it, on it a bit later is, you know, there's several level, levels of mentorship. You know, there's, there's an apprentice, like Bill's discussing, you know, having three people that are, he's really apprenticing with them. They're, they are under his wing. But, you know, we also don't know all of us here have a far reaching uh, touch um, to be a mentor from afar. You know, someone who's admired your breeding program, who's admired you as a breeder, as a judge, someone who has worked to maybe emulate something that your, your style or, or what you're doing because they've been influenced by you that you may not even realize. And we hear that so often as you know, when you said this, I remember, you know, 10 years ago when you said this, and we always refer back to someone like Mrs. Clark or, or Janie that, oh, well, when they said this, or Mike said this, or Frank said this, or, you know, what you have, we have our own mentors who have passed on, that they've given us these gems to live by. That's a far reaching effect from a mentor. And that, I think that's very warming for, for us to think about those people in that way and the influence that they had even, you know, back in the day till, till today. So what, what I think you're going towards Antoinette, sorry to take up this little spot for you, but just say, you know, we, we want people to come to us well-versed and somewhat researched um, so that you sort of respect that person to then respond to you in kind with time and patience and to take you seriously. Yeah, that's, here really, that's is, what I was trying. I would say here as I well, trying. I think it's really important for uh, on the mentor side, when you're working with someone, 
you're going to have to differentiate. This is my teacher background talking, differentiate all of that and kind of find out what kind of learner they are. And it's usually a combination of things, you know, besides the visual and, you know, the kinesthetic, I think is really important and, and the hearing and not, we don't all learn in the same way. And so I think that's such a huge responsibility of being a mentor is being able to get across to whoever you're working with and however they are able to learn with whatever they're bringing to the table as well. You know, and it's like you said, you have to work together and kind of meet, you know, 50. Yeah, I love that point because I think, and I actually think that's a huge point. Um, I think that people come to the sport for different reasons. And, Absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of young people come to this sport um, as a, as a, um, an outlet for something you don't fit in, you get a pet, you want to show it. Um, you know, there's an unconditional love response there for young people. Um, there's an exposure to adults, you know, that whole junior showmanship program to um, kind of, it's just good exposure for a young person. So I think what you brought up is great. People learn differently. There's super advantages to having a dog for um, people to you know, kind of grow into adulthood. Right, and even beyond that right side, left side brain and teaching people, you have to remember that there's um, people are passionate about certain different parts. You know, if you're a dog breeder and you're fortunate enough to have been um, or be a creative trainer, handler, be a groomer, be a dog breeder, be an evaluator of breeding stock, then you just about have it all. But not all breeders do. Some are very, very good at one and maybe none of the others. Some are good at two and maybe not the other two. But at the end of the day, um, we're involved in a, in a dog sport. And so we relate those other uh, vocations of handling, grooming, training, and, and breeding um, uh, individually. And, um, and so if they're interested in those things, and that's what I was mentioning earlier, is that when they, when they come to you and they tell you, well, I want to do this, well, what is it you want to do? Do you want to be a dog breeder? And that's the whole thing that we are here, because I think we're the conservancy or the preservation is about dog breeding, not about dog showing. And But if you want to be a dog shower and you want to show beautiful dogs and possess a beautiful dog, then just tell them that. Just tell your mentor and, and men, you know that that's what you're interested in doing. I'm really interested in right now um, evolving and uh, my, my family of dogs. And so I really enjoy um, these couple of people that are interested in also one day becoming breeders, successful breeders and, and uh, breeding on and, um, and knowing what it's like and knowing um, about the, the preservation of bloodlines and knowing that, that the, and I've mentioned this before, is that the blood that runs through all of our dogs have been brought forward to us in generations of people, not by necessarily generations of dogs, but by generations of people. And knowing the, the backgrounds and the history and the, and the knowledge of those people is what mentoring is all about. And that that's the things we need to bring forward is that information about um, uh, the preservation. I mean, we use that word lightly and quickly and always, but it is true that the, the preservation is simply about um, you know, breeding dogs that are happy, healthy, have good character, can can become can be, can become pregnant, can carry puppies to term, can de deliver freely, can raise those puppies, and and pass on their own good character through um, nurture as much as nature. And of course, humans play play a huge part, huge part of that. And you'll learn that from your mentor. So um, that's a, another aspect of it that we have to consider. Or we should I think consider. Bill brings up a really interesting part um, idea. It's like there's not just one mentor, but there's lots of different types of mentor. You know, I started as a sports person. I had a mentor for every single sport, probably multiple mentors for every single sport. And I'm kind of the opposite. I didn't research them. I saw them at a trial. They were doing a seminar, whatever. Um, kind of stumbled upon them and we clicked. And even though they had completely different breeds and some of them were breeders and they helped me out with breeding, even though they're in a completely different breed, 
we were able to click because we both understood, even though we have different breeds, we had the same goals or we had similar goals, even though they were much more advanced than I was, much more experienced than I was, they were able to take all of their knowledge and say, hey, I know you're a rare breed, there's not a whole lot of people, let me help you out because I come from this huge breed, have vast amounts of knowledge, and I'm willing to share that with you. And before I forget, I think we should all remember our mentors because there are so many of them from our past that have have left us. And it's really hard because you have to think back, okay, well, what would Dick say in this situation? What would Mia say in this situation? And we don't always have that. So being able to be thankful, you know, be grateful while they're here, remember them. Yeah, it's special though to know that you know, we do think back and think, oh, that was, oh, what would they do? You know, how, how, how did they solve this in the past? I mean, that's the whole point. Um, I mean, I think it's a really great point to, to bring up. <clears throat> we are, and I like, you know, I, I believe there are types of mentors. The reality is that sometimes where you start is the wrong mentor. It's not the way you want to go. So it's, it's just your inroads and you learn from that person even then, that this is not what I want to do. I need to seek advice elsewhere. And I, I recognize I need to upgrade from that, or I want to do something a little bit differently. And I think like one of the greatest gifts or greatest lessons one of my mentors taught me is it's not about what happens in this moment of time. It's not what about happens in this show, in this litter, whatever happens. It's about how do you get that person out of that rut and get them going? How do you create that experience? Even though they're experiencing bad stuff, because guess what? I come from a breed where well, thing is not easy. We always have tough times. How do you get them out of that spot? Like what is the best way to not just teach them, but help them out during those tough times? And I had one mentor who would always say, you know what? Another day, another dog show. No big deal. Brush it off, walk away. And I have another mentor that says, you know, when things go poorly in breeding, you know, she says, pick myself up, punch me again next time. I can take it. So that's a huge that's point that I mentioned that the last time we talked is that failure is such a huge teacher. And I think a lot of times you can learn more from the failure, you know, than you can from your success. And it, it's not an easy lesson always, but you know, I think that that really kind of determines your, your grit and determination you know, and how you're going to move forward. Sometimes you have to take a step back in order to move forward. And I was going to say, like, what Doug said before, like, and Jenny, too, like, it's okay to have mentors, to have multiple mentors, different people. You know, you can start somewhere, but, you know, you just want to make sure you're continuously learning. You know, you can pull a little from this person. You can pull a little from this other person. You know, you're on your own path, but you just want to have a good foundation. And that's what's so important about having a good mentor, someone to just point you in the right direction to get you started. And, you know, it's you're not going to agree all the time, um, but it's just like a growing experience. And as long as you can absorb knowledge from all different people, and still keep an open mind, you know, you're going to be successful in continuing um, the legacy or the lines that you are. Right. And that's, that's what we said the first night that we, or that we uh, had the program, the first program, we, we said you may not like, or you may disagree with what we have to say, you may like, and totally agree with what we have to say. But the whole um, evolution of it is that you learn from it. And, and every breeding that you do is a science project. And every, it's a, it's, it's a discovery. It's, it's a, what is the result? You should be taking notes. You should be taking notes all through uh, uh, what happened during delivery. Guess what? Um, uh, you have a bitch who has a torn uterus. Guess what? Her daughter ends up having a torn uterus. They have thin walls or something's wrong or, or uh, they, um, they don't conceive easily. There's problems with conception with those. So those are all little science projects that go along with um, every breeding you do. And, and those are just small things I'm mentioning. There can be a, 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 a multiple ones that you can, you can relate to and, and, and think of about um, particular uh, mothers uh, didn't come into milk quick and their, their daughters don't come into milk quick. There can be all kinds of breeding um, uh, uh, stops, stop marks that keep you from going forward. And, and, and you can breed away from those, but you have to be, you have to treat it as a research um, project. You have to teach it and document that information and keep information on each bitch you breed. Now, if you're only breeding, if you're, if you're someone who has one or two girls just 
consistently. You know, you can probably keep all that in the back of your head, but if you have a few, and if you're breeding a larger family of dogs, or if you um, have a tendency to forget things, uh, it's a good thing to uh, to, to document the, that information in just a, a ledger somewhere and uh, and and do those sort of things. You, you learn a lot. Um, learn you learn a great deal. Excellent. Well, let's kind of segue our conversation into, um, you know, we've gotten started. We found a mentor, maybe a few. Um, let's talk about starting the path to becoming a breeder from making that shift over, you know, um, from finding a mentor, working with people to becoming a breeder. Doug, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, there, there is, that's, that's the whole whole goal here. So you you find a mentor that you are comfortable with. I think that that takes years to develop those relationships. And you know you're you're getting started with with whatever animal you purchased first, it, it, or were given. And so you have to make an evaluation, you know, of of what this is. And that's where that breeder mentor role comes into play. Having a breeder be honest with the evaluation of the dog, where to take it. Um, you also have to then kind of size up where you are in that continuum of the breed. You know, is this a worthy animal? Is it worthy of being uh, bred from? And then make decisions from there. So the path is one that you walk down with several other people. I don't, I don't think uh, most people don't do have their first litter on their own. You know, you're under someone's wing and you are monitored and um, someone's holding your hand through that first event, no matter if you're in third grade or you know retiring at 65 and getting started. Someone's there to kind of light your way. So you wanna make sure that you have an honest, uh, good relationship with that person. As you said, you know, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. I mean, we all make mistakes, we've all made them. Um, and we learn from them, we grow from them. It's a lifelong learning curve. You're always tweaking. So that first step is all important. And I think the cautionary tale, and one of the reasons why this is so important to us is to maybe save someone from making a few early on mistakes and reevaluate that beginning. Make sure that not just your breeder is your mentor, but maybe you have two or three people within the breed that you're consulting and saying, you know, hey, is this good? Have we done all the testing? Have we done all of what it requires to make a really good, healthy start? I like that. Bill, what do you think on going, you know, making that segue and for mentoring and becoming a breeder? Well, um, it's, you know, I think this is a good question. And we, we haven't really hit on the, um, some of the problematic um, issues that are are involved with this. And that is, there are so many people who breed um, um, for themselves and for no one else. And uh, we hear that all the time. And, um, and so they don't always have a lot to share, um, uh, maybe with experience, but not necessarily with dogs. Uh, they, um, I, I, I think, um, in find, it's difficult to find someone in this day and age um, to who is uh, free flowing and open and willing to breed um, with breed dogs with you or breed dogs um, give you a dog to breed and that mentorship is so important to the future of our breed it's not the so important to the future of the family of your dogs necessarily it's it's important to the to the your breed itself particularly when you consider the breed culture of some breeds where it's the, as Doug and others of you have pointed out, it's a gene puddle rather than a gene pool. And that we can't, um, we, we can't, I have a dog that um, is in here visiting me, sorry, I'm distracted and it's a squirrel. And so, um, so at, at any rate, um, getting back to that is that we, we, we need more people who, um, who will uh, assist us in, in, pushing the breed forward that are not as incredibly selfish about their own family of dogs 
and that sort of thing. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not I'm advocating or uh, for the person who, do, who shares more or less. I'm just saying that in some degree, you must mentor someone, you must bring them around, you must bring them about, because it's not for you, it's not for your family of dogs, it's for the, for the purpose of the breed, improving the breed. And particularly in those breeds where we have um, small, genetic gene pools. It's so important that uh, you work work together. My breed, we, we, well, as you know, as the world becomes smaller, these gene pools become much smaller because we breed to people's dogs in all parts of the world now. And in that, um, it's the, the genetic um, uh, coefficients are becoming much closer rather than further apart. And so, but we need to keep them diverse. And in my breed, we really don't need, uh, I mean, my breed doesn't need me. <laughs> Um, my breed um, has many successful breeders, and I know that, and they, and they do a fabulous job. I, I do contribute, and I do enjoy it a great deal, and I do have my own way of doing it. But at the end of the day, um, there are some breeds that um, Doug has talked about a great deal also that are in, they'll become extinct if the people don't work together and you don't take on a, men a mentee. If you don't take on that person or you, or you share your dogs with other people. And I'm, and I'm not saying to be frivolous about that. You have to be very conscientious about it, but to do it with respect and to do it with a, um, a responsibility and, but, but do it, just do it <laughs> at the end of the day. No, I think that's a good point. You know, it's, there is a, um, I think because somewhat of this conversation borders on that um, sport of dogs rather than the breeding of dogs, there's a selfishness involved. Um, there becomes that um, hierarchy of power um, that gets in the way of breeding. And so sometimes the part of why I think we wanted to do this was sort of dispel some of that myth and bring some of that into play so that the people realize you're, that's detrimental to the survival of breeds and to the preservation of breeds. And I think you're, you were right to point out earlier, these are not words that we throw around. Um, you know, it, there's a great deal of depth and meaning to the word preservation breeding. It's a planned, you know, consistently planned tested breeding for great purpose rather than, you know, a random bred animal. So we're mentoring that you find, you know, broad, broad strokes to incorporate people to take it very seriously, come down from your uh, elitist attitude and welcoming into this, a mentorship, a mentor, someone to move breeds forward carefully and plan come in on the feed while we've been talking and it says so many people are looking for help online too which is I think really how we all kind of network anymore um, any wisdom on how to avoid people who don't know what they are talking about well that's part of the learning experience isn't it um, <laughs> right. and we all and we all do that we all take in I mean on a daily basis uh, we listen to information and we're fed information on social media and on news feeds and we take it in and we assimilate the part that we think is important and the other parts we disband and we we throw out so you'll um yeah you'll have to make those decisions and you'll have to uh through trial and error learn yourself which one of those things work for you and um it's everything we do you know it's like practicing medicine, right? Doctors practice medicine. Well, I guess we practice dog breeding. And, uh, and so we keep using different uh, avenues and different information and different uh, 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 DNA genetic markers. I mean, we could go on different scientific information, artful information and all of those things. So um, yeah, we, we take it in, uh, we use what we can and we get rid of the rest. Yep. But, but that's an unfortunate thing because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I always tell people, sometimes the loudest people in the room are not right. They're just loud. And you kind of have to learn that, <laughs> you know, like Bill was saying, and figure out who online is just being loud and who's being, you know, more correct. So, yeah, yes, yes. I mean. it, Go ahead, Jenny. I was going to say, when it comes to breeding, um, it's pretty for e easy for me to filter out. I look at who's actually having success. 
Like if you're having litters, you, you're probably doing a couple of things right, maybe a lot of things right. If you're not having litters, if you're having mist after mist after mist, I'm probably going to say, okay, whatever method that you were doing is not working for you, I'm not going to try that. I'm learning from your mistakes, and that's cool. Like I'm not going to do that. Um, and I think one of the things, you know, as mentors, is not necessarily saying, hey, this is the only way to do it. This is the one right way, but what way works for you? Because all of us are in different situations, different jobs, like our homes are different. We don't all have the same facilities, the same help. So we have to figure out what are the you know, factors that play for this person? How can I help them do the best they can with what they have and the timelines they have? A lot of people have restricted work schedules. They can only do certain types of readings. Like, how can I make this happen for you? and really helping them with that, arming them with all the tools that we have that we know about breeding and say, here's your options, pick some that work, let's try it. Right, and that brings us to, that's an excellent point and brings us to the point that, you know, many, you were talking about resources, um, Jenny, and resources are a valuable thing. And the most valuable um, resource we have are those mentees because um, they will help us when we, as you mentioned about help and, and those kind of resources, they'll help us um, ed, uh, expand our family of dogs. And, and those satellite type minty breeders are, let's face it, it's, it's, it's been an ongoing wave of the, of, of the present and the future. I sincerely believe that because that's the way our culture is. We have very few people who can keep um, 50 um, or more dogs and, and be the premier breeder in, in that breed. They do exist and they, did exist just 20, 30, 40 years ago, but today um, times have um, changed a great deal. We've evolved into something else, which isn't bad. It's just that we've evolved. Yeah, I mean, one of the- um, sorry. Go ahead, Antoinette. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna jump in real quick. Um, you know, I don't have much authority on this topic, um, but I love listening to, you know, all four of you and other breeders that I've met because, you know, I go into everything with brand new eyes because my journey is a little bit different. You know, I don't have a bitch. I do want to be a breeder. You know, I've had inquiries about him being a stud dog and we have litters with different bitches on the ground and a very small gene pool. And so everyone is just like, you know, when, when are you going to jump in? When are you going to do this? And, you know, I very much want to, but for me, I'm at the stage where I'm absorbing this information. I'm seeing you know, what he, you know, what his influence is with other bitches and trying to, you know, train my eye and, uh, and, and learn from each different breeder that I've worked with. Um, so it's, uh, I'm trying to become a breeder, but I want to obviously preserve this small gene pool and our, you know, the Sky Terrier breed, but I also want to become a breeder with um, with thoughtfulness and purpose. So I don't just want to breed any bitch that I get. You know, I want her, I want to try and develop, you know, my own interpretation of what, you know, I want this, what the ideal breed standard is. Or, and I'm just, I don't know, it's just a whole different perspective. Um, but I'm consistently learning from all different people and just observing you know, you see a lot of puppies on Facebook, on social media, and, you know, you quietly take mental notes and everything. And um, it's been a very interesting process. So I'm, I'm dying to get my feet wet, but I definitely want to do it with the right dog at the right time. You're gathering notes. Yes. Yeah. Building well, my plan. And, and that goes to yet another point is that, you know, we have a lot of influences. Um, it's not always you know, a direct one-to-one, -one. it's research. The new research is Facebook or TikTok or going to dog shows. You know, they, this is a new research for you, for the time. And so it's kind of a, an interesting way to do it. Um, yeah. We back, you know, we're older. And, and so we had people that we went and not sat in their kennel and cleaned their kennel and learned what the dogs were like and how to do things. And I think both are valuable. and it's all part of what we do. And, and you learn good and bad from everything and, and ways to do it. So I agree. I think it's great what you're doing. That's, it's one of the reasons why we value having you on the panel because you bring and, in that reminder. Yes. And, and, and you do don't, 
Oh, I was just going to say, you don't, um, you know, I'm 34, you know, I have only been in this world, this amazing, crazy world for, you know, seven years, but, you know, there's no wrong time to get involved. You know, you can be a breeder, you know, you can start getting into dogs as little kids and become a breeder early on. And when you're, te- even when you're a teenager, you can do it when you're my age or, or later. Like there's no, there's nothing holding you back. Spot so on. Spot everyone on. Everyone well, does it well at said. their own pace. Yeah, I agree, and and um, I really think that in this day and age, um, you know, we we Doug on the onset was talking about young blood and young people. Well, I found that uh, most dog breeders today are going to be in their mid thirties to mid forties, and when they're enter- entering, because they don't have the resources or the time to devote to it, and it does take a great deal of resources and time to do it well and right. And so, um, I think as far as dog breeders go, uh, that we're going to see more of the great people start later and probably con- contribute a great deal more um, in in their in their time that they are breeding. So I agree with you 100%. And I think that I look forward to all those people um, being involved in some some manner or the other. Absolutely, I, I think that's I, a great I point. I agree with you, Bill. I mean, to clarify that statement was that, you know, a, it's a rarity today to find someone that started out in the third grade. You know, yeah, oh yeah. On that trajectory. Right. Most people today do come to come and we learn differently at different stages in our life. So, you know, as a 13 year old boy, you're learning at a much rapid, more rapid pace and retaining more information. Um, and you're probably a little more eager. Now you don't, you lack some of the sophistication of an adult who has a different type of ability to learn, but it's certainly right. a different kind of learning. No, no question that you're right. I mean, today, you're looking at someone that's much more uh, advanced in age than a, a, a teenager. Yeah, right, exactly. You're never too old. No, I don't think so, yeah. Excellent. Let's take this conversation and let's kind of segue it into more of the breeding now and let's talk about the method of breeding. You know, uh, I know Bill said, you know, like our little science experiments where all our little mad scientists are in a little way of our breeding program. <laughs> we'll talk about that. And about, um, and our methods on how we evaluate, you know, evaluate the quality in our, in our breeding pairs or our programs or our families. Um, so let's, let's talk about that. You know, we're getting ready to breed now and we've been working with a mentor. And so we've got dogs now, what are we going to do? So let's talk about that method. Well, I'm gonna let you go first, or Bill, somebody, somebody jump in there. Well, um, you know, um, we first, um, you know, I, I find that most of the people that I think someone mentioned this earlier is that that I'm mentoring. They don't want to. They, they can't do it on their own. I think Doug said that they they need direction. They need the information. They don't have the information. They don't have all of it. So so they they do it with a mentor and and they they work together. That's why I said it's so important in this day and age that we have satellite breeders and that sort of thing. If you're independent and you want to be independent, great, and then go forward. But I find so many people want want the help and want want to. Um, have the direction of someone who, who is more experienced because there's so many facets that you have to take into consideration. And this idea that we're going to talk about um, um, the method of breeding, this is a, like a um, seven hour program. And um, we could, uh, and, and so we'll have to dedicate a program to it in one evening because uh, we, we have so many ideas. Doug and I uh, just did a presentation and we talked about the methods uh, at it. At Ignazium. It went on and on and on, and it was all new and pertinent information. But um, I think at the end of the day, you know, as I said, you do your research, you find a dog, you find you find a healthy breeder, healthy mentor with healthy, I, I'm sorry, healthy dogs and with good character, and that you are interested in that you've researched that you say that's the look I want to uh, bring forward in my dogs, and that's where I want to head and where I want to go. And so you you connect with them, but when when that breeder is going on with them for me, they know. 20 generations they don't know they're just not the fledgling breeder who knows one or two generations they know 20 generations and they know the pitfalls of going in different directions and that's uh, such a 
a, a wealth of information. And as Doug and I have oftentimes uh, spoke about, um, no matter what um, anyone has related to us, we like line breeding and um, even occasional inbreeding. But what is what what is line breeding? But inbreeding, and what is uh, an, an intense inbred, but a, just closer coefficiency? And we've talked a great deal about that. We talked about that at the presentation that uh, about um, the, the possible pitfalls of high coefficients and, and issues and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, we found um, if you breed healthy dogs and and sound dogs of character and mind and body that um, that seems to keep coming forward and that you can keep improving on it. And when you outcross, when you breed out and you're trying to capture another gene that you want to add to your dogs, oftentimes, you know, you don't, you don't do that in one breeding. It's ridiculous to think that you do. You know, of course, um, the geneticists tell us that, that the genes from that dog will never be more intense than that first breeding that you breed to them. But a lot of the old time breeders and the breeders, what, what they would do is they would do that first breeding to another line bred line, which they outcrossed to, right? And they would breed to their line bred line and those puppies would appear. And then they would take two bitches from each of those lines cross them once again with the mother's side, once again with the father's side, then breed those puppies. So it, it's not every breeding is a stepping stone to the next. And that's how um, I, Doug and I relate to a lot of this. He has some different ideas also, but, but that each, you know, you're, you're planning that, that we just talked about three generations just now to get to one um, trait that you're breeding for, or maybe a few traits in, a, in another bloodline it, because, and, and then you have to have the ability to have a satellite breeder or to keep those two bitches to outcross to the mother's side, the father's side, then take those puppies and breed them together. And as soon as you, you know, a lot of breeders think, oh, well, I'm gonna go out and capture these great traits and you may that first breeding, but all you're doing is diluting what you captured by going right back into your line. And I'll be quiet so Doug and others of you can talk about those things because this part of it, I am so interested in and I've observed and, and you know, it's just like um, I've mentioned before um, in talking to geneticists, they, they say, we can't do what you do. You're, you're Mendel, you're the actual in the trench scientist experiencing firsthand information. And, you know, it, as a geneticist, if I took your family of dogs, I would mess the whole thing up. I may know what, you know, certain things about genetics and about the uh, cause and effect and all of that, but you are Mendel in the trench, trenches breeding those dogs. And in that you have more experience than anyone else and you are the scientist. So I, 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 I can't stress that enough. And I just love that part of it. And I'll quit talking so other people can get their um, information in, which is so incredibly valuable. Um, I was going to say, so a, a couple of things, one, so I used to breed fish and with fish, it's a lot more fun because you get hundreds and hundreds of spawns. So really you can see Mendel, you're like, yeah, I got 300 and here's my 25% of this color and 25% of that color. And you get to keep them all if you can keep them alive. So you can actually see them all grow up, but that's, that's an aside. I don't do that anymore. Is there um, an emotional <laughs> attachment there? No. It is so hard to get better to actually live to adulthood. You can start with like hundreds and you end up with three adults, but you know, they cannibalize each other and things like that. And <laughs> different story, different species. It's a lot it, very different from puppies. Um, one of the things, whenever we talk about methods, I think one of the things that I'm now starting to teach people, not even people my breed, is how to do a lot of things on our own. I think with COVID happening and the lack or the accessibility to vet care very quickly, you know, no more transport, like you can't hop on a plane quite as easily, you can't ship overnight, may not get there. A lot of these things do play. So as breeders, particularly the breeders I work with, we said, okay, you know what, if we don't have access to these things, what do we pull, put in our toolbox? What new methods do we do? Some of the stuff I've been doing for a while, because guess what, in grad school, I was the person running assays. The person actually sitting there for the pipe for hours, actually doing the hormone assay. So I'm very familiar with progesterone testing, though I did estrogen and testosterone myself and um, uh, what's that other one? Oxytocin. That was the other one I assayed. Um, so that was me. So I knew how to draw blood. I knew how that stuff was. I have access where I can get stuff assayed without having to go to a vet if the vet said, you know what, that's not important. It's not dire reproduction, not a high priority for us. So 
that's what I've been trying to teach other people. If you don't have access to that, what other methods do you have? If you don't have quick transport, do you know someone who can hop in a car? Do you have a van you can live in for three days while you go cross country and do a breeding? Like, yes, I do. I love my van. I love it. I travel with the centrifuge <laughs> and ice chest. I draw blood, I spin it down, I ship it. It's great. But it's I think having <laughs> one thing I want to just interject here is you bring up a very good point that you know all of this in through all of this you have to always be making good choices so you have to have a vet that can work with you so mm -hmm. be and that's another mentor type situation where you have a vet that's on your team who is helping move this forward if you have a vet that's not interested in reproduction who is not able to do a successful C-section, who's not able to, to either refer you or guide you to someone to do a TCI, um, that's not a place for you. So mm -hmm. you have to always, always, always be on the lookout to upgrade. And because we develop very close uh, relationships with veterinaries, veterinarians that are in it with you and they are there to help you. And they're part of your success. You can't do it without them. Mm -hmm. And that is a true, true mentor relationship because they have the ability to do things that you just cannot do. I don't, Jenny's pretty hardcore. Didn't you just sew up a puppy not too long ago or something? Uh, yeah, that? I mean, I have, I have litters behind me right now. But I mean, I have rare breeds, so I, I don't have easy access pretty much. Like breedings almost always involve cross-country driving. I mean, it's just it's part of being my breeds. Well, it's what we do. That's yeah. True. It's, but, but you just you have to. Have, you also have the ability to reach out to other people for guidance. And there is a veterinarian on retainer that guides a plan. Mm -hmm. It comes back to the mentoring as well. Like, you know, Doug with his clumbers, they have to do the C-sections. You know, there's reasons that he does that. Whereas my dachshunds, most of them can free well. And it's very rare that I'll have to have a section, you know, versus Bill, what about your corgis? You know, things like that. So it really kind of comes down to, uh, you know, being mentored, knowing these lines and, and you know, knowing what we can do. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of guide us back to our, um, our question. <laughs> But that's yeah, okay I with everybody. Did I deviate? I <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. No, it's, it's perfect. Every, I love the information. I love talking about all this. Um, let's talk about the, like, the evaluation of the quality. Let's say a bitch, that we have a bitch and we want to breed. Let's talk about the things, that, the traits that we're looking for in, in order to know that we can breed that bitch. Is that a smart idea? Um, is this a bitch that has the quality and traits that need to be passed on? Let, let's kind of talk about that. And um, I know that we all have some feedback about that. I'm really curious to see what you guys think about that. Um, you know, because we do have newer people out there that have gone and, and bought a bitch. They want to start breeding. Uh, and, and, you know, as well as I do, some of our newer people don't always get the quality that they want. Or is this a bitch that we need to be breeding or they breed her anyway and then they didn't get what they thought they should have, even though maybe it wasn't the quality of the bait. We've heard these stories time and time again. Um, so let's let's have this conversation. Any feedback from the panel? I'm passionate about it. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> I actually, well, but before we get there, I'm, yes. I, I'm, I'm, I got off track and I wanted to comment on something that you said Bill but I can't remember where we were going so what was the previous question Lexa that we were talking on we were, reading. Go ahead, yeah. oh, I got, we were I got, talking okay. about this the evaluation of the quality in our breeding pairs or programs for families yeah and I, then, want, I, I remember where I was going I want the next session to be about um, the topic of you know, breeding plans, breeding choices, making those decisions. Because what Bill said, what Bill said in a nutshell is something we should spend an hour and a half on, um, which is, you know, there are ways to breed. There are ways to make uh, good choices for breeding pairs and move uh, the desired traits forward and try to um, eliminate some traits that you're not that interested in. And there are several ways to do that. There are things that we can talk about collectively that I think will help our audience. I think just having the conversation always helps us. We always learn from each other. 
And it's sort of a reminder of some of the basics of breathing and how it works. So I think that is certainly, you know, topic for next time. To your point, I'll just go first, Bill. I know you're passionate about it, but it <laughs> well, and I'll be brief, I promise. Um, you know, you, you, the newcomer evaluation, if you look back on where we all started, the reality is that we have progressed beyond where we started. We wouldn't um, always entertain the first bitch we had. I had a very plain bitch who was a very good vessel. Um, she, she was of quality, sound, uh, mentally, physically sound. Today, she wouldn't hold up the criteria uh, in terms of testing, in, in terms of how the breed has progressed in the 30 years that I've had them, 40, almost 40 years that I've had them. So, you know, times have changed. And so I would reassess her a little differently today. Is she a show quality bitch? Absolutely. Would she be something that I would be interested in breeding from? Maybe not. And you need to have that relationship with someone that can be honest and say, let's, let's start over. Let's go a different route. Maybe she's not good enough. Um, because you want to start as high in the chain as possible. Yes, it's it was hard, it's a hard thing to do. It's, it's yeah. hard to look at somebody's dog. I mean, I, I want to just bring up that little thing that Bill and I talked to this lovely lady who was showing her puppy. I'm gonna talk about this story. Um, we uh, evaluated her puppy. Um, she brought it to, for us to see. It was a, a cute uh, dog with a wonderful temperament who was just not up to stuff, snuff. It's not a, breed, a bitch that she needed to breed from. And she recognized that having sat through our discussion on breeding and evaluating her breed at this dog show that she had already come to that conclusion, but she wanted a verification from Bill and I of where her, her eye was going on what she was learning. And so she made a good choice to maybe keep this one as a companion and get another one to start her breeding program. And we had a, a nice, honest discussion on level of quality. And that's what it's all about is how far up can we go? You know, where can you get something that's truly of quality to get started? Does it meet the points uh, in a breed standard, both physically and mentally to be bred from? I think, um, I think this also goes back to the fact that, you know, when you're contacting a breeder and you're getting in touch and trying to find a mentor, this was, someone commented this on our, um, on our live stream, but, you know, sometimes the breeders aren't going to give you their best bitch. You know, you're not going to get a quality bitch or dog, like right off the bat, you know, how do you facilitate that relationship, you know, in order for you to get a bitch that's worthy of breeding, you know, like there's a lot of people who are so cautious that they just want, they, don't give the, they keep all the quality. And so that's not really helping anyone. I'm not saying like, give your best bitches away, you know, but definitely, you know, I think more mentors and breeders should have a open mind. And I mean, obviously you have a contract and everything. It doesn't have to be a ridiculous contract, but you know, if you care about this bitch and you're going to entrust it with this new person, you know, guide them, keep an eye on them, walk them through everything. Right. It's really if you care about this breed. Right. We have to keep going back to that. Absolutely. Good point. Um, can I just say that um, I believe this so sincerely for all of you out there trying to get a really great dog. Well, just because the breeder keeps the one um, that may phenotypically be the most beautiful doesn't mean it's going to produce the most beautiful. Its sister of lesser quality that you acquire can produce the better puppies. You don't know until you start breeding, right? So if you can get to be a friend and be mentored by someone with a, a line bred line and you may get a bitch from them, you can take that bitch in the first generation and have that puppy that you really want. It's going to take some work, right? But you can have it because you have the genetics because it doesn't matter um, if you have the second, third pit 
bitch. They share the same genetic gene pool and they can produce the same. I believe that's so, so much. And I've seen it time and time again. The beautiful show dog uh, that I have that just has all the beautiful uh, phenotype uh, produces marginal and then her her, her uh, lesser sister is the is the great is the greater producer so that's how i look at it so i think it's more about genes i think you know gene uh, phenotype is represented by gene type but so many people think that phenotype it's all about phenotype that's why they make a mistake when they go to a specialty and they go oh my god did you see how beautiful that dog is i want to breed to him and they don't even sometimes they don't even stop to think about what his mother and father even looked like. They just, it, it, it's an anomaly. It's so beautiful that they're breeding to phenotype, not to genetic type. So that's just my two cents on throwing that out there about that okay. too. Very I and I think, right, I think that point right there is you have to do your research on the line to really know what it is. Just like Bill said, you don't know what the parents look like. Well, for me, when I look at a beautiful animal on the ring, I hopefully already know where it's coming from. And I know what the parents are and I can go, oh yeah, the mother looked just like the bitch I want to breed to that dog. So maybe that could work. And then I'm going to go back and look at the pedigree and see if there's any flaws there. Because for me, and for so many of us who don't have large kennels for anyone, it's all about breeding smarter, not harder at this point. You know, I mean, breeding is so expensive anymore. <laughs> and vet care and everything else, you know, you have to kind of don't go out of your means to breed because you can still push a breed forward with one litter if that's all you can do, if that's right. in your means versus the 20 where maybe you're hit or missing and now you've taken a third mortgage out on the house or whatever people do <laughs> to try to make it work. Like, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I'll echo what Bill said. Um, you know, my first Louchin bitch, beautiful finished, pretty much undefeated, award of merit since she was a puppy at nationals. And you know what she produced? Nothing, not a thing. I could not get her pregnant. You know what, her sisters, lots of litters. I got absolutely nothing from her. Um, and I did want to address one question I saw on the live feed about that, about getting a bitch, a nice bitch from breeds that do have really small litters and it's really hard for a breeder to let them go. Guess what, I have one of those. 2.5 puppies is our average litter size. Now, I've had litters of four and five, um, but it's still hard because, you know what, I got a lot of boys, don't have a lot of uterus to go around. So it is tough. And I would say, I think it was Katie was her name, was in that, develop a relationship with the breeder because it is all about trust. It's not always about, okay, I'm going to give you the best bitch. Sometimes it's the only bitch on this litter. And so as a breeder, we have to think, am I willing to let this go? Is this person going to be influenced? Is this person going to like say, oh my gosh, well, someone else on the internet told me to not breed her because you know what? She's not the exact right shade of whatever color is going to, you know, like, is, am I going to lose that ability to carry this breed forward because this new person may not necessarily follow through, may be like, well, I felt like saying it because my vet said hey all dogs should be stayed new so hopefully that doesn't happen has happened before but developing that relationship ensuring that that breeder can trust that they are giving you probably the only bitch in that litter that you're going to be able to follow through and if you're not able to breed say hey you know what I can't do it my work schedule doesn't allow me I financially can't do it right now or I'm moving whatever that you allow that breeder to have that bitch back and say we can still continue this line we can still continue this because this is the only bitch. Excellent. I just want to. Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. I just wanted to piggyback on that a little bit. You know, from the opposite perspective. So, from the person who's inquiring about getting the puppy. You know, I just. We live in a society now where people want things right away. They want this, mm -hmm. this, this, and they want it when they want it. You know, like. So I think people really need to be a little more patient. You know, if you're looking for a bitch. If you found the people that you want a bitch from or a dog, whatever, you have to wait it out. Like sometimes they'll do, you know, two litters a year, you know, sometimes it won't take, you just have to be a little understanding. And, you know, if this is something that you really want, don't get distracted and go to another breeder just because they have puppies on the ground, you know, stick with something and the timing will work out. I just yeah. think I've been 
you know, I've tried to help people find puppies. And my biggest pet peeve is that they have their own time frame already established. And it's like, that's just not how this works. This is not like a fast food menu. You have, you know, if you really want something and you really want to do this, it's worth the wait and just be patient and things will, will happen. And it also gives you time to build that that relationship with the mentor. Yeah. You kind of learn a little bit more about each other. You learn about the dogs. You know, I think I think the key is to just kind of slow down a little bit sometimes and not expect yeah. to get the dog you want Wonderful. and the color you want right away, right? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Great point. Right. Because Maybe. you know, we want we want people like that. You know, you want someone who's invested in waiting so that they're going to wait for what's right. And most top quality breeders are always interested in finding someone like that, that you can bring in because it's to our advantage to have yet another person get involved. And it's a give and take. And so you're, and you're, and with that comes a a little bit of loss of control from the breeder, a leap of faith from, from a breeder, but it's all, it's all worth it in the long run to sort out and maybe have someone start uh, their own trajectory with your own kennel. I mean, one of the advantages to having someone come in like that is that they're going to say over time, eventually produce something that you would be willing to breed to as well. And that's sort of a goal, especially some of us that have these rare breeds, We need you to make a new combination so that it's a value to the greater good. I just want to go back to one thing very quickly that Bill said about the two sisters. Well, you know, the other sister that is your producer, you know, she has to be bred right. And she has to be bred with that breeder's guidance, because if she is not as aesthetically appealing as her sister, If you breed her back to her family and into those dogs that you find appealing, and I hope we'll concentrate on this next time, she will be good to you because she's bred to reproduce. Excellent point. Yeah. And and earlier when I said I was passionate about some of these things, is one of the things that I went to the new people and Jenny hit on this a, a bit and you're going to get tired of me talking about it. But that is that we select so much on aesthetics of dogs. We breed on aesthetics. We breed. We select on aesthetics. We do all that. But there's a greater part of, of being a breeder that you have to take into consideration. And that is conception rates the ability to carry the puppies to term, the ability to deliver freely, to um, deliver the puppies if so, to care, nurture, and raise as and be good mothers, be um, extremely good mothers. That's part of what you should be looking for when you also consider a family of dogs. Because let's, let's face it, if you're getting litters of seven and eight, you have more to choose from. And there's more of a genetic possibility that you're going to have something there that you can choose that's going to be fabulous. You might even have two fabulous ones. You're also going to have a greater selection of results of uh, genetic testing as far as health health and health anomalies and 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 that sort of thing. So so the the larger numbers you can get in, in a litter rather than um, you know there are these bitches who won't conceive until their third see until the third time you breed them. There's those that don't carry them to term that will conceive and then not carry the puppies to term. There's those that have puppies who die in delivery. There's those people, there's those dogs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's so important to consider that as well. So I'm just throwing that out there once again for your consideration when you go to someone to see what what they have available. I think that's an excellent point, really do. And I, I, you know, so much of just good basic animal husbandry. Yes. comes into all of that in that foundation. And and also what Antoinette was saying about being patient, you know, sometimes people get so excited because finally the breeder that they want to get a puppy from has a litter and they grow them up, but then you can't forget about breed nuances like a, a clumber back going off. So they may be beautiful at four or five, six months old, but the back goes off and doesn't come back on. Well, that's not necessarily something that you know, I mean, Doug, that wouldn't be a desirable for you for what you would want at all. So that would be, so if Doug doesn't want to do it, why would somebody else want to do it? 
you know, I mean, if you're newer, you have to kind of think about it that way. And, you know, I think we've all experienced breeders have removed beautiful animals from our program because they had problems with reproduction or they were producing way too, this problem way too often, or, or they weren't a good mother. Um, you know, so I think those are all things you have to consider in the big picture before you even get litter on the ground, <laughs> you know, to keep going forward. Excellent. Yeah. It's part of the science experiment. It's part Absolutely. of the science experiment. The Absolutely. the elimination of stock based on <clears throat> what happens over time. It's what we do. I, I think that the, these are all really good points. Um, it's all uh, part of the collective thought process of what happens in, in making and planning breedings and how we do it. Um, I think what you talk about, Bill, is so important because if you think about it, in at the end of the day, a conception rate is vitally important to the survival of a breed. Um, if you have a bitch that you are struggling over and over and over again to get pregnant, maybe she's just not worth breeding. And you have to let that go. It doesn't matter how beautiful she is. Uh, you, that is a trait that is a dead end. Well, and how many times have you guys, I've, I've done this two or three times and I've not been breeding near as long as you guys have. Um, I've, I've cleaned out my kennel two or three times, just saying you're beautiful, but you can't stay. You know, time to clean up and you know, tighten up the program and, and things like that. And that's just, you know, some of the realities of the situation, I think, of being a successful breeder is making those hard line decisions. And, and letting, I had a bitch, she was um, a beautiful bitch. She finished like a dream, you know, beautiful to the standard. And she quit taking care of her puppies at three weeks old. Why well, wasn't gonna do that with her again? I don't wanna do it. <laughs> that's your child, that's what you're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> you know, and having a full-time job and everything else, I just thought, well, I had her sister, so I let her go and kept the sister, you know, her puppy. Well, I, I talk about this a lot. I think that, you know, you have to be the, your harshest critic of your own kennel and your own dogs. And so that's that self-evaluation. And there are many times that you go through and think, uh, I'm, I'm eliminating these for this reason. Um, and, and you do that with every litter. You know, that's, you're a hard critic of your own dogs and that keeps your quality high. Excellent. Let's um, move forward into um, our last part of our conversation for tonight, for this session, um, is the methodology. We're just the very beginning parts of the methodology of breeding dogs. So it's just how to plan the litter using the tools that we have, such as testing AI, progesterone, ovulation, the natural feeding versus the C-sections, um, just the very, very beginning part of planting the litter. We'll do the meat and potatoes of this part of the discussion the next time we meet, but um, let's kind of touch on this here for our next few minutes um, to wrap up our session this evening. So, you know, how do you guys go about planting your litter? It's going to be different for everybody. I mean, we might use the same basic methodology type of thing, so as far as phenotype, genotype, or whatever, but... Um, we all kind of do it differently at the same time. It's kind of the creative part of being the breeder, right? So, um, you know, what, do you, what are your thoughts? How do you plan your life? I think the first thing that you do when someone comes in season is look at your calendar and you think, can I devote my lifetime to this right now? Am I prepared to bring this responsibility right now into my life? Do I have time for it? Are you financially responsible? Are you able to do this? I mean, those are probably the basic first steps to seeing, is this the right time to do it? And from that, then you start to look for help. Who's gonna help in the process? How do we manage, because we're all busy, how do we manage adding this to yet, you know, to your already busy life? That's probably where I start. And can I get it done? And then I start looking at the dogs and what I'm going to do. But as many, many, and Bill and I would, but the reality is we've already planned who and when. 
It's just, can it happen now? Excellent. Jenny, what about you? When you get ready to, you have a bitch in season, how do you decide about your letters? Well, I'm, I'm probably like Doug in the, in the way that I do plan ahead. I plan probably a couple of generations, a couple of seasons far in advance. And luckily I work remote now so I can make things happen. It doesn't matter where I work. So that part has been easy. The tougher part has been finding help, particularly for the Swissies, because when you have large litters, we always hire help. Somebody lives in with us or comes to us a couple of times a, a day, because doing that plus a very demanding day job is, it's not easy. It's really, really tough. And that's why, you know, by the time I recover, I'm like, oh my God, I can't do that again. And I'm like, oh no, I have to do it again, because this is an awesome bitch. And she produces wonderfully. She's a great mother. She produces really nice puppies. Um, that's how I go about it. And I have read enough that I am set up that we have whelping boxes set up all the time. Everything's in tote. So the logistics are pretty easy for me to execute now, at least in my other breed. Um, Swissies, it's a little harder and don't really have access to boys. So it's like, well, she's in season. I better get ready to drive, drop all my plans, drive 12 Doug, hours, take off Doug, work. Doug said he'll volunteer to be your first partner. He's really interested in that. <laughs> But Thank I you, do Doug. Have a place to, if you need a bedroom to stay, you can come. <laughs> you know, I always. I got a new van. I got a brand new van. It's totally okay. tricked out. It's nice. I'm going to blow up mattress in the back. You're ready to get your spend the night. It's great. It'd be great. Uh, when I do my litters, you know, my I had a band director. If you didn't know, I was a band director the first five years of my career and I quit because I wanted to do the dogs, because it was way more fun, so anyway, um, but I had a band director always tell me, you know, you plan your work, and then you work your plan, and so just like Doug and Bill and everybody, that's what I do as well, and uh, I've had a bunch of plans in place for the last two or three years, but I put them on hold, because I was the national show chair for DCA, and so I thought, well, I can't handle puppies while that's going on, and then COVID hit, and I wasn't able nothing happened and everything was canceled. And then I wasn't sure if I could get vet care during COVID. So then I put it off again because I thought, well, what, what, what if, what if, what if? And so now I'm just kind of waiting. Um, but, you know, for me, that's what I like to do. It's everything's planned out, just like they said, ready to go. I'm just waiting for the girls now. And I do the same thing as Doug. I'm a full time, I have a full time job. And it's very demanding and I only get 10 days off a year because I summer because I'm a teacher. So a lot of my letters try to happen during the summer and that the girls don't always coordinate with my plan. So it becomes very difficult sometimes. Uh, so that's kind of what I do. Bill, what about you? Well, I'm very fortunate uh, because uh, as many people know uh, in my breed, we have a whole team and that team was not uh, willy nilly um, came up, come, come about. And when I tell you, um, I, um, we have a, we, one of, one of our associates or our associate and breeder co-breeder is a veterinarian, a reproduction veterinarian. Um, we um, have um, a, a couple satellite people who we work with that um, also help, help us breed. We have, a couple of, thank goodness, um, people who are patrons to our dogs who um, pay to have them shown and um, and campaigned. Um, there's myself and um, I have an incredibly good kennel. I don't want to call it, I don't like to use that word kennel manager. I have someone who facilitates my dogs being happy every day and uh, we both work at that and they have a good time and um, we, that's Part of the reason I moved to, um, I, I have a home in California and a home in Missouri. And the home in Missouri, I wish I could take photographs right now. I have these beautiful paddocks that they're out running in right now. It's a little hot, granted, but um, they get to go out and those and run all day and come back in, enjoy the air conditioning, then go back out and run some more. And, and um, so it's really also all about... Um, if you're going to breed, um, as Doug said, you need the resources and ability to, whether you're having one litter 
or you're having four litters. Uh, you need to be able to take excellent care of them. And so um, I have a great support team and, um, and uh, not that I need to say this, but I'm a little ADD. And so I'm, um, I have a million balls in the air doing different things at a million times. And so I have so many great people from Deborah Salo, Kevin Foist, Steve Larley, Be Dr. Becky Williams and um, Amy, um, a spear to a Jody uh, and others. I just, I have this huge, and, and you make that as you go on. And I'm sure every successful breeder who has a larger breeding program does have those kind of, that kind of support team. So I'm, I, I, and I, and it didn't just have, it, it just didn't happen. You have to work at it too. And you have to build those relationships. Like we we're talking about this evening about mentoring all those people um, they were so interested in from Deborah Salo uh, to Kevin Foyce to Dr. Williams about about the breed and about what what we could do and what we could create and about the future uh, of our breed and what we've done for it. And, um, you know, uh, we've done incredible things as far as it, within the sport uh, with our dogs and just as others of you on this panel have. But uh, and and reach some really high plateaus because uh, we were passionate and we worked well together. And you know, at the end of the day, um, we it it, it it was it was our passion who, who brought us there. So anyway, um, I I it isn't something that you have to do. It's something that you love to do. And 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 breeding dogs is something I love to do. I'd rather do it than anything else. I could. Quite clearly, and as Doug will tell you, I, I judge far less right now because I love just being home and around the dogs and doing that part of it. And um, and uh, so and so um, I, I mean, no, I'm a little bit off off uh, topic here, but um, yeah, I um, I'm a fortunate person. I'm just taking mental notes of everything. I'm slowly just I'm like, okay, so I need. To get some help i need good people around me i need a good repro vet um i've been fortunate to see doug's whelping room so i mean that's burned into my brain it's like the coolest thing i've ever seen so <laughs> i'm when i become a breeder i'm hoping that i can have a really awesome setup and support team when i get to that point so i just love hearing all these different perspectives from you guys so thank you i think that um it's actually a great place for us to segue into our next discussion, which will be very specific on um, ways to breed, planned breedings, how to make choices for breedings. Um, I think this is, we've given them a nice way to start to think about how to get started um, by forming that mentorship and, and actually making an assessment and then to sit down and decide, okay, how do I get started? And we've done that. Great. Um, I'm going to, does anybody have anything else you want to add just to kind of wrap up before? Um, I have one thing. I think, okay. you know, with breeding and all the different breeding methods and what we do, it is a progression. I'm always changing what I do every single litter. And it is kind of tough when you first start. I had a litter of three, my very first litter, and I thought I was going to die. And now I'm managing multiple litters and I'm like, yeah, I can do this. The Swissies are a little harder, but you know, once you learn and you develop a, prog a process and you start refining, it gets easier. So don't be like, oh my gosh, my first litter, it's got to be perfect. It's always a learning process. And usually if your first one's perfect, the next one's like, it goes sideways. You know, something happens. So <laughs> it's just, it just ebbs and flows. You know, you just have to mm -hmm. kind of go with it sometimes and be flexible as a breeder, I feel like, which is, it's hard for me because I'm a control freak. So sometimes you just have to be like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think that everyone has to remember. Um, I had used to have this little sticker that said, um, "Life victors um, aren't always quick starters, but rather those who persevere, because uh, quitters never win and winners never quit." So that's what a dog breeder has to do in a nutshell. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, we're going to kind of wrap up this evening. Any uh, last thoughts, Doug or Antonio? I just want to say one last thing. I know we I've been seeing we've gotten a lot of comments on the video and a lot of questions. So we're going to do our best to filter through them and answer some of the questions that we weren't able to get to tonight for next time. Um, so if we didn't answer your questions this session, you know, don't worry, we will get to it. So
just thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. and maybe we could remind people that you know we want them to go on to the um, Facebook page and invite their friends. There's a tab where you can push that and invite as many people as you want. We're looking to grow the audience. Um, we've um, doubled in size since the first one, which is exciting. Yes. So we want to keep that rolling out and encourage people to invite people. Absolutely. So um, everyone out there, you have homework. Your homework, which I told you at the very beginning, is you know to ask at least 10 people to join the group, the Canine Conservancy group. Let me be specific about the group. Um, and then... Your challenge between now and the next uh, live we have next month uh, will be to give us um, some feedback and input about topics that you would like for us to discuss. And like I said, um, this is the, the discussion this evening is a first of a three part series about Breeding 101. Obviously we're not gonna get everything covered. And as Antoinette said, um, your questions and comments we will address as we go on. Uh, you know, just, pop up here and show up once a month. We, you know, meet several times in between to plan and discuss. So we'll make sure that those are added in. So that is your challenge. Um, and the last thing I do want to say that we had talked about too is, you know, uh, a lot of us are still actively showing and, you know, some of us are judges on the panel. And so, you know, we're going to dog shows. So if you see us, don't be afraid to come over and say hello. Um, you know, uh, any of those things uh, we want to have, you know, especially people like, I'll, I'll say Doug and Bill, I think probably a few years ago, I would have been super intimidated to go up to them and, um, you know, they're people and have all this wealth of knowledge and information. So uh, don't be afraid to, you know, if you see us come say something and, you know, we'd love to chat with everybody. So uh, that's all I have for this evening. We're so glad that everybody joined us panel. Thank you again so much. I'm going to have you hang back after I cut off the live. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, have a good evening. Are we still on? I think, I think we lost Alexis. She froze. Mm. <laughs> uh, let's see. I can still see it moving on my screen. Yes, yeah, so. my my screen says live on Facebook recording. We're still live, so that's cool. Hey y'all, we're still <laughs> here. <laughs> this is what we do. That means that my computer just went down, and we are still live. She said, "Glad okay. we're done, but we're good night, still everyone. We're just going to sign off. <laughs> night, guys." Leave meeting. Goodbye.